Good evening. Tonight I'm going to be reading you a soon-to-be classic of literature. A fantasy epic in the making. And so I present to you tonight chapter one of this incredible undertaking. I'm reading off my phone because it's only available on PDF. Fuck you, that's why. The Sword Overlay. The greatest high fantasy novel ever written, written by Riley Almanzor. Do not steal. For real. I will eat you, then kill you. Chapter 1. The Becoming of a Hero. Erlay fought powerfully against the fleshy, heaving, sepulchral walls of the prison where they'd been spending months of being imprisoned. The deep green membrane of the nightmare dimension that threatened to forever confine them was ubiquitous and omnipresent, and also everywhere. But Erle wasn't the kind to give up, ever, because their iron willpower allowed them to eventually concur any challenge. Even really hard newspaper crossword puzzles, like the ones in the Tallahassee Times. Anyway, Riley battles against the moist walls of the organic tunnel that tightened and heaved and constricted around them. They pushed forwards, regardless of the resistance and the flooding around them, and moved into a direction towards the distance. Even in the infinite darkness of the nightmare dimension, Erle knew, because of their incredibly intelligent brain, that there would be a light at the end of this endless tunnel. And they were right. Their normal-sized pink eyes suddenly beheld a passage towards freedom in front of them, as the gate to the world yawned open. They forged onward, powered by their indomitable warrior spirit, crawling with arms and legs rendered pathetic and feeble by months of being trapped, though they wouldn't remain that way for long because Erle would later become super ripped. But we'll deal with that when we get to it. Until they finally reached the opening. They crawled and crawled and crawled, which is when they made their way out, and was received by a giant pair of gloved hands that received them in a hero's welcome, and lifted them aloft, like Simba at the start of the Lion King. It's a ghoul, the mystic says. Erle's father, Tethanya, who was of the weak constitution, fainted. Carmencius, Erle's mother, was too busy reading a copy of Eateth, Prayeth, Loveth to give any real reaction. But this was a foolish decision on her part. The first of many, but we'll get to that later. Because little did they know that the greatest hero that the world has ever or ever will known had just been born in the year of 1193. When you look up the dictionary definition of hero, you will see the definition, a person, especially a man, who is admired by many people for doing something brave or good. And also the definition, the main male character in a story, novel, movie, etc. I.e. the hero of the novel is a ten-year-old boy. However, the hero of this story is, however, neither a man nor a ten-year-old boy. They are gallant, good-looking, extremely intelligent, 
Like, really, really intelligent. Think if you fused Einstein, Stephen Hawking, and whoever invented aluminum. I feel awful saying it that way. Foiled. Ghoul, hero, or lay of the order of Manzaral, first of their name. Erlay was an orphan, except from their mom and dad, born in the grand kingdom of Tallahassee, Florida. The kingdom had been founded by genocidal humans hundreds of years earlier, before it was abandoned by God. But we'll talk about that later. Even from the young age of zero, people marvelled at how strikingly brilliant at how the young ghoul was. They were able to get one complete side of a Rubik's Cube. No, look up Middle Ages equivalent of a Rubik's Cube later, in only a few hours. Their eyes were a normal size and were absolutely not too large or uncomfortably scary, whatever the fuck that means. Their spine was also perfectly straight, much like the mighty sword they will later use to slay monsters and villains. Growing up, everybody loved Orle, even though they didn't need that kind of external validation in order to feel a sense of self-worth. They were beloved by their classmates at the Knight Academy, where they graduated with flying colours and also all their teachers, who were experienced wizards and knights, loved them and used the correct pronouns, thy thine. Even when they may have allegedly accidentally ate one of their academy mates' cats during Bring Your Familiar to School Day, they weren't suspended, and everyone totally understood that if Orlais' mom actually packed the animal crackers like she promised, then young Orlais wouldn't have been hungry, and... From a young age, Orlais knew they were destined for something greater than living in their suburban village. They knew in their big green heart, and their hyper-intelligent, perfectly smooth brain, that they would grow up to be the most important ghoul no, being in the world, or even the universe. But it's chapter one, so let's maybe consider that another time. Several years later, Orle woke up in bed, now a brave and adult warrior, who had excellent social skills that made them a hit with everyone who had the honour of conversing with. Orle had just woken up, from a dream in which they'd been eating a giant marshmallow and had awoken to find that they had, in fact, consumed a live raccoon in their sleep. It had somehow crawled through the cracks in the ceiling and entered the vicinity of Erle's face in hopes of stealing their eyes with its little thief hands. This was a terrible idea, and the last one the raccoon ever made because Orle is still at least 70% combat effective while sleeping. They're just that good. They slurped down the tail like a noodle and considered what to do next, as the time was still 5 a.m. and none of the local areas had not been beckoned by the rooster's call to open because of how early it was. Instead, they decided to head to the bathroom in order to help prepare themselves for the coming day. In the bathroom, they took their daily morning shit before staring into the bathroom mirror. They had perfectly sculpted facial features that felt like it was drawn by Michelangelo or Master Splinter. Their deep but normal-sized eyes betrayed the concept of dark pink in an aesthetically powerful manner. You could easily get lost in Orlais' eyes because they were windows into the deep and tortured soul of the one who the eyes belonged to, Orlais. 
or lay lived in the dungeon of their parents' castle, believing that living in a sense of self-induced hardship would actually sharpen the rock of their diamond-hard willpower into an even harder hardness. Erle had faced a number of challenges in their life, such as finding the people and places around them overwhelming to their heightened senses and powerful brain. People violating Erle's sense of personal space and everyone else being too ignorant and dumb to understand how brilliant their various thoughts and theories were. The challenges Erlay faced in their formative years were part of what made them so incredibly strong as an adult. Erlay's parents didn't get them, because Erlay didn't think the same way as them. They assumed that Erle wasn't actually as brilliant as they really were. Tithaniel was a small, weak, and feeble creature that seems so ineffectual that it's actually one of life's great mysteries as to how they could produce a being of Erle's calibre. Erle's so-called mother Carmencius, on the other hand, was a beast of pure and unrelenting darkness. She was the source of all evil in the kingdom of Tallahassee, and it was by a grand prophecy that it would one day be Orle's destiny to defeat her. She was perhaps the ultimate carrot. She would walk into local taverns, demand to see the manager, and then vaporize them with her fiery gaze just for fun. At restaurants, she would regularly send food back to the kitchen with strange and unworkable demands, like make it higher and turn it green before sending the restaurant's entire staff to the hell dimension. Even if it was Erle's birthday and they just wanted some chicken tenders and a plateful of mozzarella sticks. Carmencius had Tathaniel totally dominated so she had complete authority over the household. Carmencius was a boundlessly cruel and controlling authoritarian despot. Certain bathrooms in the castle were totally off limits, and there would be hell to pay if any of the many portraits were slightly askew. She could make orcs cry and dragons shit their oversized dragon pants just by looking at them. But that's enough about that evil old bitch. For now, let's talk more about Erle. They're what everyone is here for. We'll open from here, en medias res, as Erle, who's now 27, is entering the esteemed merchant's palace. VII slash XI, I can't be bothered translating Roman numerals into actual numbers at the moment, where they are well respect even if not entirely understood. The merchant at the desk of selling, Jeffoni, greeted them with a wide grin of unbridled adulation to hearken Orle's arrival. They're precisely six feet, two inches, with long, approximately 1.4 feet, silver hair that is considered neither masculine nor feminine. They also wore a set of sleek almost impenetrable arm that perfectly fit their muscular form and still gave enough space for their rippling 12-pack and thick, powerful biceps. Also very powerful was the jawline attached to the jaw, attached to their statuesque visage, which had been known to make people fall into fits of uncontrollable joy, crying or even just stare for hours with its sheer aesthetic wonderfulness. 
their skin was as grey as the granite that reflected the hardness of their granite hard abs. And their sharp teeth were as white as the bones they often ate with their sharp teeth. But coolest of all, in their large muscular hands was their fabled sword, which many would refer to simply as the Sword of Orle. It was several feet of stainless steel with a really cool handle that had rubies and stuff on it. Orle, my liege, you honour my sword with your incredible presence. Jephoni says, eyes of stars and love. Might I perhaps say that you are looking particularly strong and smart today, even compared to usual, which is a lot. Fuck ye off, knave, Hurley says, elegant hair flowing powerfully in the wind inside the store. Thou knowest that I needeth not your petty compliments, for I have a fully accurate assessment of my own greatness. Jaffoni cowered in his foolishness. He was dressed in like shitty rags, and he was ugly too. And stupid, unlike Orle, who was incredibly intelligent, and also wealthy and good-looking. If you saw Orle, you'd be like, By the nine, that ghoul is a complete smock shot. But you wouldn't need to say it, because Orle already knows. My apologies, O oh great one, Jafoni says. That was so foolish of me. I'll punch myself in the face, it's what I deserve. And he did thusly as Erle gave an approving nod with their extremely aesthetically pleasing and intelligent head. You're welcome to take endless quantities of the great chewy crimson vines as your endlessly compassionate heart pleases, O oh grey Erle. You do such a service to this kingdom and giving you this free nourishment for your many exciting quests that people will find about, out about later in the book is the least I can do. Well met, kind Javoni, Erle says. Can I have a big gulp too? For a hero's thirst while quenched by victory also requires the assistance of ye old soda. Of course, Erle, you can even drink directly from the nozzle to quench your heroic thirst. For I would not even dream of attempting to stop you or even reprimand you for such an act. Erle gave another heroic nod and proceeded over to the realm of confectionaries, situated between the flagons of fine ale and the energy drinks. There, Riley filled their prestigious mouth with honourable fistfuls of bears of the small and gelatinous variety. They then moved on to the hard candy. And of course, the incredible blood crimson vines. However, Erle's ordeastic culinary journey was rudely cut short. When sudden, forsooth, it beeth that weird guy I see sometimes in the capital circle wall marketplace. Let us all point and laugh at them. Ha 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 ha! said an ear-piecing, nasally voice from behind Erle's broad shoulders and perfectly straight back. Erle whipped around at the speed of a really fast horse and saw some of their sworn enemies, the vicious goblin children of Montford Middle School, pointing and jeering at them with these immensely punchable shit eating little fuck-face grins. If it isn't our gallant and good-looking heroic enemy, Erle of the Order of Manzaral, you really must be as brave as they say you are if you plan on showing your face around here, said Kevin, the leader of the goblin children. Don't creatures like you belong in the zoo? 
You motherfucker! Erlay yelled, their sonorous voice booming out of their powerful chest. You take that back immediately. I shall not, the fiend said, his ugly, stupid face dripping with fiend liquid. Kevin and his two fellow vicious goblin children, Tyler and Brayden, all begin to chortle at her lay, showing their boundless idiocy and depravity. It is important for the reader to remember, while everyone loves her lay, there were those who did not love her. Her lay had many enemies, mainly because these enemies were jealous of the fact that her lay was so much stronger and cooler and more beloved and smarter than them. Some of these monstrous foes include Frank Linnaeus, the local security guard who guards the gates to the ancient crypts where the most delicious bodies are buried. Genifreus, the mean receptionist who refuses or lay entrance to the local ancient library after the so-called book-eating incident. It was actually an ingenious experiment on Orlais' part to see if knowledge could diffuse directly into the brain via the stomach. But few were as mean or as dickish as Kevin and his minions. Foolish goblins, Erlay roared. I will crush thee with mine facts and logic, and also my sword. Kevin gave his infuriating cackle, and Borderline gave Erlay a headache. Of course, he was a complete fucking idiot for thinking the power of Verlay's epic mind couldn't utterly destroy him and his band of sneering brigands. Verlay's thoughts were sometimes so powerful that they could not survive within the brains of others. They would actually cause the brains of less powerful people to physically explode. Your facts and logic are not that great. Kevin cackled his voice cracking a few times in the process because he was probably secretly afraid of her leg. They are so great, fuckface, her lay ingeniously retorted. My brain is perfectly smooth and spherical, unlike the earth, which allows me to hold my prodigious knowledge so perfectly. The goblin children had bought into the lies of the government shills like Copernicus. So hearing Erlay so casually drop that blistering truth about the real shape of the earth was actually pretty mind-blowing. That gave them pause, just long enough for Erlay to take advantage of the pause. They sprung forward with gorilla-like grace and deliver a brutal punch to the nose of Kevin, the little shit he was. Oh, just what the fuck, Erlay? Kevin whined. He stumbled back, oozing red life juices dripping down his stupid little face and also on the powerful knuckles of Riley's fist. They licked the blood off their knuckles with their tongue, and honestly, they looked fucking badass. It definitely made Tyler and Brayden back down a little because they realised who they were up against, and they were totally screwed if they proceeded to actually fight. But it was already too late, because they'd already challenged Orlay, and when you challenge Orlay, there's no way to win other than apologising a lot and just really hoping that they show mercy. Which they might sometimes, because they can occasionally show heroic compassion. But not this time. Because Kevin and his satellite fuckers had been little shits to our lay before, and frankly, they'd already gone way too easy on them before. This time. Orlay would make a real example of them. Well, they would have, anyway, 
if their attempts to do so weren't interrupted by the sudden intrusion of the phone. The weak bootlicker to bring a cessation to the end of conflict. You cannot fight in here, warriors, Jafoni says. The Isle of Confection is a sacred place, one that must not be tarnished by the blistering fires of battle. But they started it, Erlay correctly proclaimed. Even though you are right, great Erlay, I cannot bend the rules in this area, or my rulers will banish me, and I will be forced to sell ye old blood and semen in order to make ye old ends meet. By this point, the goblin children had already fled bleeding and weeping. They knew they could not best a swordsman as adept as Orlay in single combat, so to flee would be the only way to ensure their pathetic survival for another few days. Nobody had ever been strong enough, or cool enough, or smart enough to best or lay in battle. Which is why they have a reputation for being so amazing and unstoppable. Because they are amazing and have never been stopped. You're being a little bitchit, Jafoni. Orlay said, pointing a normal length finger accusingly at the merchant. You deprived me of the glory of victory that was rightfully mine. That was not cool. Jafoni fell to his knees and began to bow in worship at the feet of the tall buff warrior that was Orlay. Like many in the godforsaken kingdom of Tallahassee, he was a slave to the corrupt hierarchies that constructed the cancerous, bottomless fissure many dared to call society. It seemed only Erlay himself was above the dark machinations of the sinister, secret, monarchical forces that worked behind the scenes to manipulate anyone and everyone who wasn't as smart as them. Jafoni was just one of the countless victims of whose only chance to escape was following in the footsteps of the brilliant mind of Erlay and their epic statements of raw, unfiltered truth. Please, Erlay, take pity on me. I know not what I do, he says. I really can't afford to lose this job. My health insurance is tied to it. Her leg groaned. Fine, I'll leave. But only because I want to, not because you told me to. And I'm taking the crimson vines and the ye old soda with me. Of course, great her leg. You've earned it with your powerful abilities and wonderful social skills. Erlay took into within their hand a handful of crimson vines. They, sheathing their sword to use the other hand to grab a large carbonated lime life beverage. As Erlay left, Jafoni lovingly kissed the ground on which Erlay had been walking. Outside the magical self-opening doors of the, I've just realized that, 7-Eleven, Erlay prepared to unlock the padlock around their mighty metallic steed, Erlazor, which they could use to ride on their various quests around the kingdom of Tallahassee. Erlay had gotten Razor for their birthday when they were eight years old. They'd actually asked for a more conventional bio horse for their birthday that year, but they instead were given the unyielding metal handlebars of Razor, which, according to Tathaniel, Erlay's tiny and feeble father unit was far cheaper and easier to maintain than a bio horse, and they didn't have the space in their house which was bullshit because if they did actually love their children they could have helped them build a makeshift stable in the garden and gone halvesies on horse feed so think fast folk nuts 
said an irritatingly nasal voice behind her lay, which they hadn't previously noticed on account of the fact that they were, as they often were, deep in important intellectual thought and rumination. The brutal wood of a skateboard was smashed brutally onto the back of Orlais' perfect head with brutal force. It made a loud crack as the strength of the skull smashed the skateboard, but sent Orlais shocked and in pain but they were handling the pain well, and they didn't cry because Orlay is a badass and does not cry, fell to the floor. That's for punching me in the face, you psycho, said the mysterious voice. It was Kevin, whose nose was real fucked up now, and his two goblin cronies, Tyler and Braden, who were giggling along to try to hide their fear. Nobody makes me feel my own pain, Hurley said, springing up to their feet again and drawing their powerful sword to prepare for epic battle. I let you leave earlier, and you still decide to try to battle me here, where no obsequious loser douchebag clock can save your sorry asses. You've made a terrible mistake. Kevin gave another throaty cackle with a bunch of voice cracks because the little shit is like twelve. And he thought he could defeat the considerably more adult and wiser and stronger and cooler Erlay. You've met your match, Erlay, Braden says. Shut the fuck up, Braden, Riley said. Nobody was talking to you. Braden did indeed shut the fuck up, as he should have. I've defeated warriors way bigger than you, Erlay. You're not even that tall, Kevin said. I've defeated warriors who are at least like seven feet tall, easily. It isn't the tallness that counts, you little jack and ape prick. Erlay, who is now getting heated, bellowed. The size of my strength far surpasses yours. Then come and prove it, you stupid girl. Three on one. Kevin yelled. The three goblin children squared up and drew their smaller, shittier swords that weren't anywhere near as cool as our lays, probably because they had weaker arms and therefore did not have the strength required to carry a huge, awesome great sword like Orlay. Orlay steeled themselves and raised said giant great sword, which could, could cleave non believers and government agents into Shania Twain like butter. Then have at me, you little ships, her lay roared. I will not be defeated. And so began the next epic battle. Kevin lunged forward with his short piece of shit sword and swung it at Orlay, who dodged perfectly and kicked Kevin in the nuts, causing him to curl into a question mark and shuffle to the side, clutching his balls. While his two minions surged forward with their swords and began dueling Orlay. Even though there were two goblin children fighting them, Hurley parried their blows with little effort, prolonging the battle mainly out of a sense of personal amusement and because they felt like getting some decent arm exercise from the battle. However, Hurley would typically have to fight at least ten sword-wielding brigands to even break a sweat. Because Orlais is so powerful, they can dual wield great swords and fight different people with each one independently, standing on one foot and badassly kicking a third guy with the other. Kevin, who had regained some semblance of control over his balls, rose back to his feet and picked his sword back up with his hand. 
He was too foolish to realize that he should have given up and fled long ago, like the little coward shit face he was. But he did not. Why won't you give up, Hurley? Kevin yelled as he charged at them. Hurley squared up and prepared their mighty sword. Because I am a true hero, and true heroes never give up. Now prepare to fucking die, you worthless chode. Her lay daringly proclaimed as Kevin drew closer. I've eaten snails more threatening than you. Kevin and the other two goblin children converged on her lay, using 100% of their power, while her lay was only casually using around 17% of their own. All this bullshit was basically just like a light workout for someone as cool as Arlay, while for basic normie bitches like Kevin, Tyler and Brandon were fighting for their lives at full force. This, among other things, is the reason why it was so incredibly stupid for such low-level fighters to come and bother Erlay while they were just innocently attempting to procure some confectionery supplies for their many adventures across the kingdom. It was an absolute fuck show of iron and steel. The three blades of the goblin children clashed with the one way cooler blade of Erlay, causing sparks to fly across the 7-Eleven horse parking lot. Over time, the goblin children began to tire, and also their bodies started to ache, while their lay was just warming up. They knew that soon something was going to give and change the course of this battle. And then it did. It was known by all the local peasants that he so often terrorised after school that Kevin was a prolific gamer. His gamer rage and use of racial slurs was infamous, as well as the intense hormonal sweatiness of his hands. As the battle progressed, Kevin's hands only got sweatier and sweatier until the handle of his sword grew slippery. Erlay realised this because of the audible duck-like squeaking the sword made in Kevin's sweaty gamer palms. With one final decisive swing of the sword, Erlay smashed the little shitty sword out of Kevin's hand, sending it rocketing into the air and spearing a seagull in Apalachicola. Kevin was defenceless and his two goons were frozen in shock. Erlay had won an astounding, dominating victory. Owning these darks so hard, they had, they had no choice but to drop the rest of their weapons and surrender to their obvious better, Erlay. Oh, great and terrifying, Erlay, Kevin said falling to his knees before the mighty warrior and bowing his head in fealty. I bend the knee to you. You have bested me. Correct, Hurley gloriously proclaimed, their hair blowing in the wind dramatically as they struck a heroic pose. I'm glad that you realise the sheer extent to which I've kicked your ass here, Kevin. Tyler and Braden were slowly backing away, rightly fearing the deadly retribution of the legendary warrior they'd spent the last 20 minutes pissing off. While Erlay could indeed be merciful, due to the fact they were so heroic, Tyler and Braden had made the assumption that their unacceptable behaviour had really burned that bridge would not stop Kevin from groveling, though, much to Riley's satisfaction. He blubbered and cried and begged like a weenie. Having my ass it's so thoroughly whooped by you has taught me a lesson great, Erlay. I have seen the error of my ways and resolved to devote the rest of my life to emulating your heroics and helping others like you always do. 
I know I don't deserve your forgiveness, but I pray for it nonetheless, on the off chance that I may make a more positive impact on the kingdom of Tallahassee. Kevin beseeched. Erlay took a moment to ponder the snivelling little goblin's request, as the rest waited with bated breath to see the gallant ghoul's verdict. You're right, Kevin. They said, you don't deserve my forgiveness. Erlay unhinged their jaw and ate Kevin's head in one bite, leaving his headless neck to spurt a stream of blood into the air. His body slumped to the ground as Erlay crunched up and swallowed his head as his two cronies ran away screaming. You learned a valuable lesson today, fiends, Erlay yelled after. Never mess with Erlay. With their foes vanquished, Erlay took a victory slurp from their ye old soda to wash down Kevin's lame after time. They loaded the headless corpse onto the back of Ray's oar to act as a road snack for their later quests. For this was basically a prologue before shit would then go on to get really real. Erlay would later look on their battle with the goblin children of Montford Middle School like a treasured childhood memory compared to all the exciting and perilous shit they'd go on to do in later chapters. Erlay climbed onto Ray's oar, their mouth full of sweet, delicious crimson vines, and rode on towards the adventure that waited ahead. To be continued. That was chapter one of The Sword of Erlay, the greatest high fantasy novel ever written by Riley Almanzo. I would say that I hope you enjoyed it, but I already know that you did. When later chapters are released, I will record them for you and add them to this playlist. Thank you for listening.